everything. Yeah. He, he's he's a good guy. I yeah. knew him when he's handing out flyers. He was a street barker for the Boston Comedy Club. He was in a poncho handing out fucking flyers. Two for one. Come see live comedy tonight. Do you guys want to see like those guys? Yeah. Like I knew him when he was that. Yeah. And he said, I want to, and we, we were friends pre go. I used to drive to Seal Beach with him to go play basketball like, with guys that took Did you, you guys didn't overlap at all because you don't have No, we didn't work together. I mean, yeah, you were you probably shot some nights together, but you didn't have no scenes together. No. You were probably that, that horrible parking lot um, at the Santa Monica airport, which was like the bane of our existence. The one that we reshot three times. Three times. Kept getting rain so, in the go, camera. Yeah. Fake rain in your Anton camera. Oh. Go is a tough movie to shoot, and I learned a lot just shooting it, but also learned like not to write movies that are t- set entirely outdoors at night, because that just killed us. Who had to read for that movie? Almost everybody read for that movie. The only people I think who got... That's how hot I was back in the day. Yeah, you, yeah. I actually was offered, which one of these roles yeah. would you like to play? Oh, those Piven, were the days, John Piven, August. Piven had to read. Who? Jeremy Piven. Oh, he didn't get it, though. No, I was like, who did he play? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think everybody. He read. was the Miata. He was the Miata. <laughs> he played the Miata. I would say on Twitter, once a week, someone will just tweet, "It's a Miata!" Yeah! Exclamation point! Exclamation point! Oh, God bless the Miata. That's another reference that doesn't hold up so well now because there aren't Miatas now, so people don't understand like what that car was. They, I think, they crushed them all when they were done. Um, yeah, everyone read. I, Katie read. Um, Sarah didn't read. Sarah didn't read, but she was in Canada. And yeah. her and Doug, did they wind up dating? They did wind up dating for a while. Yeah, because I remember, I, I wasn't sure they were dating, but then we had, we wrapped Sarah like she shot all her stuff, and suddenly she's like hanging around set. I'm like, what are what are you doing here? I'm like, they both oh. they're such rebels with causes. Yeah, they are like kindred spirits. Yeah, Doug's the Doug's the Doug's the briefcase that the guy in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square is holding. <laughs> yes, absolutely. She's the guy. Yeah, Doug Doug, is, Doug. Doug is probably in the tank because he built it himself. I don't even know how I got in the tank. I'm in the tank. <laughs> he is truly one of the more crazy people I've ever re- worked with, but he's an absolute genius. And I, the ex- explanation to bring you up to speed, yeah. and I'm sorry to yeah. backtrack, yeah. was when you're around like in Eastwood or there, there's certain like directors that are brilliant and there's just a light and everything's illuminated when you're like you get it. Doug has that light, but it's more like a laser <laughs> where if you're in that laser yeah. light, you're bathed in fucking – other level Mensa brilliance, but if you're just to the side, <laughs> you're just looking at a crazy person with food on his face. Yeah, I love Doug, and I, we all love yeah, Doug. What's not to love? Um, but it can be frustrating because Doug has that quality of sort of like the serial killer in like a serial killer movie or like a psycho movie, like where they you, you knock them down, they just they pop back right up and keep walking. And that you needed that for Go because we just kept getting knocked down and again and again and again. But you're also when you need to stop him, it was very tough because he you know, again he had the the camera on his shoulder the whole time. So when I would need to have a conversation about like why the scene wasn't working, it would have to do like to him and while he had the camera on his shoulder, like in front of the actor. Yeah, and Doug Lyman, and for everybody listening, was is his own camera operator and his own director of photography. So mm-hmm. most of Go, which really is not supposed to work out, yeah. is that one guy holding one camera. Holding a china ball of light, like yeah. like those lanterns outside yeah. sushi bars. That's why he's lighting the whole scene, just following you around with that. And when you watch Go, it doesn't look different from like Ghost Whisperer, which took all day to light a yeah. fucking ghost from a crane on the back lot of Universal Studios. So you, when you work with a guy like Doug, you go, well, why are these DPs taking all day to light? I watched Doug Lyman walk around with a flashlight, a bug light, and a china ball. Yeah. And, and I remember he said one of the best things when we were getting our wires put on us yeah. uh, in the scene before we go undercover, we were in that like shitty, dingy uh, bathroom like in Venice. Yeah. It was like just a public men's yeah. room. And I, he goes – Getting ready for your crotch shot? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it was Scott's crotch yeah, shot. Yeah. Uh, and well done, I might add. Yeah, yeah. Very well done, yeah. sir. Very sticky fingers, Rolling Stones, album cover, well played. He, uh, he goes, okay, we're ready to go? We're all ready to go. It's going to be great. And you're in like this dark, dank, <laughs> and usually, as you know, from shooting yeah. other films, it takes forever to light everything. And I go, well, isn't it really dark in here? And Doug goes, yeah, it's great. <laughs> like he was so excited that he was shooting in the dark. Yeah. And when you watch the movie, you would have no, and I don't know how much of that is but done I mean, in post. It, how, how many times did we reshoot that scene? I mean, that was the weird thing with Go. That's, that, we didn't reshoot that That was only one time. There were a lot of times where like we would shoot it once and like, oh, that didn't work. We'll shoot it again. Oh, that didn't work. We'll shoot it again. And 
and it does. So as an was actor, you think it's because like eh, not that good a performance. No, no, so you have no idea that, that there's nothing on the film. Yeah, yeah, I didn't I know that until work. you just said that. Yeah. I didn't realize that. No, no. It was it was almost never about performance. It was all about, like, you know, we couldn't actually, like, there wasn't enough stuff to use. And to his credit, I, Doug's philosophy was he wants to aim for, like, 80%, but, like, get through things much, much faster. And then if we have to go back and reshoot stuff, we'll reshoot it. And it's almost a Marine mentality. A, yeah. a, a, good, a good plan now is way better than a great plan later. Yeah. Yes. And I always thought it was like guerrilla warfare, the way we shot. We were in that liquor store in Venice with no permits. Nothing. And cops start circling. And that's when Doug came in, and he couldn't get the performance out of Scott and I. And Scott and I had no idea what he was talking about. And he said, let's say you're a gorilla. But he doesn't, like, know you're a gorilla. But, I mean, he, you look like a gorilla, but you've never, like, said, like, hey, I'm a gorilla. And he just kept going on and on. And Scott kept going, like, I don't know. And finally, I pulled Scott aside and said, if you ask him one more question, I'm going to fucking punch you in the face in front of this entire crew just do it and we did it and he goes see you guys are gorillas yeah and that that's really doug that's he does doug. get the performance out of you yeah if but you it, just yeah. act like you're following his direction yeah if, he, if he'd given you the like the one sentence or like you know if he said faster that's something you could do right it's when a director gives you like five minutes worth of like stuff you're like, a gorilla I, yeah Be no, he actually said that to me i wasn't yeah. joking yeah. he told me i was a gorilla and scott thinks i'm a gorilla but he's not sure. There's a scene where two, two a lover and a, a lover two lovers find out they're cheating on each other, yeah. and they're kind of hashing it out while they're buying liquor. Yeah. That's the scene. Like All this, this could be fun, but do it as gorillas. Yeah, and that's how it went. Yeah. How do you? And you know we lost the sound for that um, that sequence. <laughs> no. Of course, the sound fell out of sync. <laughs> yeah, so we, we faked it all afterwards. So everything went wrong. Everything went wrong. And that's why it went so right. Yeah, of course. That Don't was, you that's... miss those days? Cause I you're, do miss those days. Charlie's days. Angels, Corpse Bride, yeah. uh, Willy Wonka and the Charlie Factor, which we'll get to. Because yeah. that's, that's, that's got to be almost like a, a burden mm-hmm. to have to write perfection. Oh, but it was great. I mean, that was a dream project. Loved but it. How do you – because I asked Koppelman, like yeah. with Ocean's 13, like yeah. – it's sort of the tablet is there. Yeah. So you're just sort of are, are you just putting in different colors? I I, w- I had never seen the but forgive Gene my version. analogies. No, no, sorry. I'd never seen the Gene Wilder version. What? Yeah, which is a, a, such a blessing. So I got to go in fresh, and so I loved the Roll Doll book, and I remember I'd written to Roll Doll when I was in third grade, and he wrote me back a postcard, which I'd still held on to, and so it was like it was fate, it was destiny. I was supposed to totally do it. And so Tim Burton, like the longest meeting you'll ever have, a, I've ever had with Tim Burton is about 15 minutes. And he's like, we want to do Charlie and Chocolate Factory. I want everything from the book and as much else as you need so it all makes sense. Like, okay. And so, that, so I, I pitched him back like the father backstory. He's like, oh, that sounds great. Do you think if you had seen the Gene Wilder, you would yeah. not have gotten the job? It would have messed me up because I would have thought of like, I, I would have compared what we were doing to what they were doing. Constantly, right? Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. So that's why I said lose, lose, because I had just assumed you had seen yeah. the Gene Wilder version. No. You lose. Good no. day, sir. Yeah. But instead, Night you have yeah. this incredibly unique uh, tablet of, of uh, this canvas of Johnny Depp. Yeah, yeah and but it's also a chance of like I can write, you know, two hundred squirrels sit at on stools sorting nuts. I'm like, I don't have to worry about how to do that. Someone else can train those squirrels, and someone else trained those squirrels to do that. <laughs> I didn't have to. I didn't have to be there. Didn't have to show up. Didn't have to do the thing. And one Oompa Loompa. And one in Palumpa, just who I worked with in Mafia, uh, Deep. What's Deep Roy? Deep Roy's awesome. Deep Roy has this is the little person who's of Indian descent. He's the Oompa Loompa in Charlie, the only Oompa Loompa, and he also uh, played a small so part in the pond, small part in Mafia, where a, like a seven foot priest at Lloyd Bridges and, uh, at my wedding, Lloyd Bridges, my father, he opens his robe and goes, "Say hello to my little friend," and Roy Deep, Deep steps Roy. out. Between his legs with a little tiny gun. And Roy Deep had the Deep worst Roy. Deep Roy. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, tomato, yeah, tomato. Went, yeah. I, I, I could hear the comma that you were putting in there, but yeah. And uh, Roy, comma, <laughs> thank you, John. Very, that was very nice of you to save me there. Uh, Deep Roy is one of the filthiest. He's like Bob Saget. Like he almost <laughs> has Tourette's. Like I remember taking a golf cart. Back to base camp, and he goes, "You big fucking dick, big dick. You fuck, suck. You eat the pussy. You fuck, like nonstop. Like he had Tourette's almost." And I realized it's one of those things. Like if you feed the fish, they just yeah. never stop coming. And I had to make it like, uh, you know, I'll play grab ass with the best of them. But he's a guy I had to like just straight face and just put a wall up and go. So I don't what. And he goes, "Yeah, you motherfucker, you motherfucker." Did he, was he like that in Wonka? No, not to me at all. No, he was, something he was, about he was a, me. He's a, he a perfect gentleman to me. So, like, I don't know what it was. Something about me. Something about you. 
Uh, People weird, say to my wife, okay. Yeah, the weird thing with, with Deep Roy and Daniel Palumpa is part of the reason why you do the duplication of like one guy is that those kids could only work like three hours a day. And so you had like the other half of your day, you had to like fill it with something. So they would do all the musical sequences with Deep Roy in the afternoon. It was literally just production. But kids didn't play on Palumpas. Those were grown up. No, dwarfs. but I'm saying that the, the kids in the movie, the kids yeah. like who Violet and Augustus and all this Augustus stuff. Augustus Gloop. Augustus Gloop. An actual German kid who did not speak English, um, which was just fun. This made, made life extra challenging. How long after you were completed, did you see the Gene Wild? Was there a part of you who was like, I want to yeah, see I it had, so I bad? Had, I had to see the Gene Wilder version. So once but I you had to wait till you were done, right? Yeah, once, I handed, smart. It, once I handed it in, you then I watched it. You are a fucking it. smart guy. You, you don't watch bullshit. all the, the choices made, like where they went left, we went right. It was, it was really strange. And by, that was just by providence. Yeah. That's just what, how it worked out. Yeah. And you must have been, were there parts of the Gene Wilder that you went, oh, I wish I had done something differently? I have not seen yours. Yeah. Oh. Just so you know, I'm oh, not leading. You see mine, I will, yeah. but I'm not leading down a road yeah. of like you did this wrong, you did that right. No, I have no. nothing to compare it to. No, they made different choices about who was really the center of the movie, and you know, to me, like it was a story about this kid, this kid Charlie. But once you really got to meet Willy Wonka, he was the Willy Wonka was the kid who, was the person who changed over the course of the movie. He was yeah. the one who like he was this crazy old shut in who had to learn to let people in. That was the, the the point of my movie, and that was just a very different way than how they did. Gene Wilder's character was sort of perfect already in uh, their version. He didn't have to grow or change or anything. And the kid, like, tries to steal stuff. And it's a different way of doing the movie. Spooky. Like, oddly, like, sexy, spooky Gene Wilder. Yeah. I thought. And magical. Yeah. And magical. Odd. And, like, there's a, there's a, something dark on the yeah. news that, that only he, he – like, if he denied it, you wouldn't bring it up again. But there's something dark under all of it. Where there's, a, there's – to me, yeah. when I watch the Gene Wilder Willy Wonka, you're like – is he going to yeah, murder you everybody? Don't to, you don't want to cross him, yeah. Yeah, but there's nothing in his performance. It's just something behind Gene's eyes. Yeah. And when he snaps, you lose. Good day, sir. You go, okay, I'm not that far off. Yeah. Scratch that. Reverse it. Uh, also, you, their factory feels like a real factory. And yeah. I knew that we would be able to sort of go much more fantastical. So even the world of, of Tim's Charlie and Chocolate Factory – like you know, early conversations, like, are we going to set this in the U.S. or in England? Because like they sort of split the difference in the book, and he's like, no, we're going to sit in the middle of the Atlantic, and so wow. the cars drive down the middle of the road, so they're not one side or the other. Accents are sort of this neutral, sort of halfway in between. And that, was, that was the choice. So that's sort of like for a guy that discovered writing like War of the Roses and stuff, you were really given like the keys to the kingdom of your own childhood imagination because it was one of your favorite books as a Absolutely. kid. Absolutely. It's the thing I always wanted to Dream a job, right? Dream job. Is there a job out there that you think is of that caliber to you? You know, I've gone after some things that have been real goals and, and hopes and dreams of mine. And sometimes the Wiz? Wiz Part 2? The Wiz Part 2, totally. Like Tarzan. I always want to do a Tarzan movie. So I, Fuck, yeah. Yeah, so I spent... Two years doing a Tarzan movie, and then Warner's didn't make it. And then you so, realized Buster Crab was dead? Yeah, he's super dead. You, um, really, you realized Johnny <laughs> Weissmuller was just dust? Um, like, so oh. I, 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 I pitched this. Um, Fuck, I'm sorry. Phone. Yeah, do you know how to turn off a, uh, a, an iPhone? It's fucking Brian Koppelman. Ugh, curse him. Um, so I, I, who I, did you have? When you write, do you have yeah. a person in mind to play it? Yeah, back when I was doing uh, Tarzan, it was Diego Luna. Like a Mexican actor, because um, I, who doesn't want to see that guy flying around the jungle? Come on, he. Uh, the pitch for mine was that it's it's Tarzan story, but it's modern day Africa, so it's civil unrest Africa rather than khaki and pith helmet Africa, which I thought was interesting. And Warner said, "Yes, we love that." And then after like four drafts, he said, "Like maybe we should set it back in the past." And like, you, I, two years I've been working on this, so that's the frustration of being a screenwriter. Is like you can spend a tremendous amount of your time and your life. Working on stuff that never becomes anything. Now, is that something that you would want to pick up again at a later date and redo? If, if yeah, they, but I'll they never, have I'll, to do it your way. I'll never get the rights to it again. It's really? Because yeah. you got the juice now. I got you, some juice now. Yeah, you got the heat where you can go. I'll only do it if you do it the way I wanted to do it. Right? I, some heat, but not enough heat to be able to do that. I can't. I can't pick a project I want to do. I have no. To, no, I have to go in and, and meet on stuff. They don't, I mean, they'll send me some stuff, or if there's a piece of talent who really wants me to, to do something, like you know. I'll be called in to like work on something for some weeks, but like I can't go in and just set up any movie I want to set up. Not at all. I know you as like the most regular, like um, just a sweet neighborhood guy, but then you hook up with Tim Burton and you write like the darkest stuff. 
And then like with Big Fish, you write like this this great father-son, fantastical bedtime story stuff. Is that just the you before we met? Like where that all comes from? Because the guy I know, you're just yeah. you're no. like Richie Cunningham. Yeah. To me, I, to, like I'm, I'm I Richie think Cunningham. Some of, some of it was deliberately trying not to get pigeonholed because before Go, I got pigeonholed as being the guy who adapts kids' books because the first two projects I got were How to Eat Fried Worms and A Wrinkle in Time, which are both you know good classic kids' books. It's not on your IMDb page. No, because they haven't 